this. The disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan has set off a debate in the international community about the future of nuclear power. Demonstrations against the use of nuclear power have drawn thousands in India, in South Korea, in Germany, Japan, Brazil, Taiwan. Governments have taken notice of the renewed safety concerns of nuclear power. There are currently 440 reactors in operation worldwide, generating about 14 percent of global electricity, and plans for new construction have soared in the last decade. India and China, in particular, have set ambitious targets for expanding their nuclear programs. China uh, has plans to construct 70 new nuclear power reactors by 2020. On Monday, the fifth review meeting of the Convention on Nuclear Safety kicked off in Vienna. The U.N. Atomic Watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is the primary international body that builds international cooperation around nuclear safety. However, unlike their regulatory role with nuclear proliferation, the IAEA has no authority to enforce safety recommendations when it comes to nuclear power. IAEA Director General uh, Yukia Amano addressed the opening session, which was scheduled before the crisis. Amano told delegates, the worries of millions of people throughout the world must be taken seriously. The situation at Fukushima Daiichi remains very serious. The immediate priority is to overcome the crisis and stabilize the reactors. But we must also begin the process of reflection and evaluation. The worries of millions of people throughout the world about whether nuclear energy is safe must be taken seriously. Rigorous adherence to the most robust international safety standards and full transparency in good times and bad are vital for restoring and maintaining public confidence in nuclear power. As of the end of 2010, more than 60 IAEA member states had informed the agency that they were considering introducing nuclear power programs. Almost all the 29 countries, which already had such programs, planned to expand them. In the light of Fukushima Daiichi accident, some countries have announced reviews of their plans for nuclear power. However, the basic drivers behind the interest in nuclear power have not changed as a result of Fukushima. These include rising global energy demand, as well as concerns about climate change, volatile fossil fuel prices, and energy security. Nuclear power has contributed to expanding the supply of energy and has also reduced greenhouse gas and other emissions. The IAEA will continue to work closely with both established users and newcomers to ensure that nuclear power is used efficiently, safely, and securely, and without proliferation of nuclear weapons. In the light of Fukushima accident, we will redouble our efforts to help newcomer countries to put an effective nuclear safety infrastructure in place well before the first reactor starts up. That was Yuki Amano, IAEA Director General. That's the International Atomic Energy Agency. For more, we're joined by Jan Bernek. He is the head of Greenpeace's nuclear campaign. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Jan. Uh, talk about uh, the IAEA and its role in nuclear power around the world. Good morning. Well, so we may have heard, actually, from the speech of uh, Mr. Amano, uh, the IAEA is now focusing its efforts to restore the public confidence in nuclear power and to help other countries expand uh, the usage of uh, civilian nuclear reactors to generate electricity. And uh, this is actually one of the bottlenecks of the problem, which is that uh, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is not, as many people may perceive, an objective body whose uh, first priority is to enforce strong safety standards. But it has a mission which is uh, encoded in its uh, status, which is actually to promote uh, civilian nuclear power and expand uh, nuclear power worldwide. So in that sense, IAEA actually has a conflict of interests, which we may see happening before, after Chernobyl accident, when again 
it was saying all the safety standards need to be improved, uh, there is transparency, there are all these conditions in place. But yet we have seen uh, the Fukushima disaster, and uh, it seems that IAEA is sticking to the old same, uh, same tune. Can you talk about the response overall, Jan, to this nuclear disaster that is unfolding in Japan? I think it's a bit early to say how the world moves. I'm pretty confident that uh, there will be changes in uh, the energy policies and in the new build plans for new reactors, although some of the countries have been fast to say uh, we are not changing anything, we are not moving single inch from the original plans. We have heard such voices from, for example, South Africa, India or France. But as the time goes, uh, we've also heard uh, some dissent notes also, for example, France, where the French Nuclear Safety Authority said, hold on, uh, no one can say actually that accident like that cannot happen in France, and we need to be very careful and make a thorough review of both the safety of the current fleet of reactors that are in operation in France, and especially about the plans to build new reactors. Uh, so there are examples that uh, some countries try to stick to the business as usual, but some countries uh, are actually already moving away uh, from, uh, from uh, their original plans. We have seen big shift in Germany, uh, to give you one example of an uh, industrialized country, where the government basically decided immediately to shut down eight of the oldest reactors. And uh, now we hear the politicians in the government to say that the, sp the speed of the phase-out of nuclear power in the country will be faster than before, so by 2020, potentially, they will shut down all the nuclear reactors. Can you talk more, Jan, about China's plans for nuclear power and then your understanding of the what President Obama is pushing for, a nuclear renaissance in the United States, building plants for the first time here in some 30, 40 years? Yes, the role of China actually is uh, pretty exclusive, because if you look at the number of reactors countries have been planning to build in the coming decades, then China is number one. It has been mentioned it uh, basically considers building 70 or 80 new reactors, which is unprecedented growth. And if we talk anywhere in the world about a nuclear renaissance, then actually the place where it may be happening is in China. It's not Europe, it's not U.S., because uh, the number of new reactors is limited and it can it actually can be zero at the end. So China at the moment is building 27 new reactors simultaneously, which is a massive uh, new build program. But we have also heard from the Chinese authorities that they are going to take very seriously the lessons from Fukushima and uh, they have basically put an embargo on approval of new reactors, and they are going definitely to look into the safety standards and the quality of construction in the reactors that have been already, whose construction already started. So we actually see a potential big shift in China as well, which is coming from the fact that first, the number of reactors is massive, and of course, if accident like that happens in China with a high density of population, then uh, the impact might be very severe even for such a large economy. And second thing is that most of the reactors China has been building so far are actually the so-called second generation. So they are more or less the same design as Fukushima. The design has been done in 1970s, 1980s, uh, yet before the Chernobyl disaster, and therefore they do not reflect on the experiences and accidents uh, that have been happening recently. Mm. I want to go back to Philip White uh, in Tokyo from Jan Baranek, speaking to us from Amsterdam with Greenpeace. Philip, we just talked about radiation of the water, but what about the land? What about the air? And the fact that the Japanese government is now beginning to question the 14 more new nuclear power plants that it had planned to build by 2030. Um. The initial focus was on the radioactivity released into the air and to the land, and that was probably less than it might have been because a lot of it was blown out. Well, it was blown out to sea um, in the with the prevailing weather conditions, um, and what we've seen is elevated levels of radiation over a reasonably broad area, but particularly some hot spots that go way outside of the uh, exclusion zone. Um, the exclusion zone has been set at 20 kilometres um, and then another further 10 kilometres beyond that where people are supposed to stay indoors. So, but this is far too small a region and we've been calling for a more extensive uh, exclusion zone. 
Um, and uh, radiation has been... Eleva elevated levels of iodine have been found in the water in Tokyo, for example. Um, so I think you're going to have contamination of food over a, quite a substantial area. Um, but uh, now what we're seeing is this shift to uh, release of radiation into the water, in, into the sea, and that could be even more severe in some senses. But I think it's more... It's easier for uh, the public to turn off to that. Um, it's really the fishermen, the, the fishing people who are most impacted by that. But when people are actually uh, seeing it in the actual land that they walk walk on, on the milk that they drink and the vegetables that they eat um, and the water they drink, people are far more sensitive to that. Um, as for the impact on the, of this on the overall program. I think there's two things to be aware of. One is that that program was never a realistic program. Um, there hasn't been the demand for an increase in power, um, and the power companies have had these plans for years and years and years, but each year they set their plans back another year. So the rate at which power plants have been built in Japan has been much, much slower than the uh, um, official plans. Um, but these, I think it's going to... I think it's almost impossible for any new plants to be built in Japan now. I, I um, want to go last to Jan Baranek. Uh, Jan, we just have a, a few seconds to go, but we talked all about the IAEA, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, but what I wanted to ask about was about IRENA, um, which is the International Forum for Renewable Energy. I think we just lost Jan on the telephone in Amsterdam. Philip White, if you could talk about renewable energy as an alternative to nuclear. Um, I'm sure Jan would have spoken about it better, but I, I'd like to uh, point out something about the Japanese perception. Um, and that is that uh, Japan has no choice but to go the nuclear path. This has been thoroughly inculcated into the Japanese mind. Um, but, in fact, what has happened is that uh, uh, people have, n have not been given an opportunity to think about different ways of, of meeting energy needs. And um, I think as long as you focus on provision of very large amounts of power and ever-increasing amounts of power, as we saw in Armanol's speech, um, then you'll inevitably find yourself being attracted to nuclear power, whether or not that's the best solution. It's still um, a mindset. But if you start looking instead at the, at the demand side and thinking of the most efficient ways to deliver the same energy services and putting the incentives in a different way. The incentives are now directed towards maximising sales of electricity. But instead, if you put the incentives towards the most efficient provision of energy services, then all sorts of different possibilities open up and you can drastically reduce your energy demand. Now, in... Uh, let speech. me interrupt no because we just have a few more seconds, and we did get Jan Baranek back on the phone. The question of renewable energy. We talked about IAEA. What about IRENA, which is the Renewable Energy International Forum? Jan Baranek. Looks like we just lost him. Well, we're um, Philip White, your last point. Okay. Um, and what, so what I was pointing out is that if you listen carefully to Yukio Amano's speech, it was all premised on the assumption that there was an ever-increasing demand for energy. And I think it's just common sense that we cannot have an in, in, in ever-increasing supply of energy. So unless you start to look at the physical limits of, uh, of our planet and think of doing things differently, then you're not going to come up with a solution. What we are pushing for now is to try and convince the people of Japan that there is another way and get through, break through the indoctrination they've received over the last 30, 40 years. I want to thank you, Philip White, for being with us, International Liaison Officer at the Citizens Nuclear Information Center in Tokyo, Japan, and to Jan Baranek, who is the head of Greenpeace's nuclear campaign. He is based in Amsterdam. This